Well, hello and welcome to this Health Foundation webinar titled, Is the NHS Ready for Winter? My name is Ruth Alby. I'm the Assistant Director of Policy at the Health Foundation and I'll be your host for this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and for this next hour and 15 minutes. Just to note, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website within 24 hours and a subtitled version shortly after. We've got some really excellent speakers to help us think about the state of health and care system in England going into the winter. We've got Anita Charlesworth, our very own Director of Research and The Real Centre, the Research and Economic Analysis for the Long Term Centre at the Health Foundation. Anita is a health economist and a seasoned analyst of the real numbers behind the government's presentation of them. We've got Dr. Amar Shah, Chief Quality Officer, at the East London NHS Foundation Trust, responsible for performance, quality and planning and a leading expert in quality improvement. We've got Hazel Summers, Director of Adult Social Care Improvement for Partners in Care and Health. It's a joint partnership between the LGA and ADAS and is herself a former Director of Adult Social Services. And we've got Dr Gemma Tetlow, Chief Economist at the Institute for Government, whose remit is broader than the rest of ours, looking at the health of public finances and services in the round. Welcome to all of you. Just a few words before we start about the topic of today's webinar. Is the NHS ready for winter? Many of you will be tempted just to say uh, no. Winter pressures on the NHS have dominated the headlines for many years now, but at this time it's a steady drumbeat of very gloomy statistics, which is distressing for patients and staff. Just yesterday we saw that in October 7.2 million people were waiting for elective care, while for the last three weeks on average over 13,000 hospital beds a day have been occupied by patients who no longer need acute care, but have not been able to discharge from hospital. It's getting on for 95% of all general and acute beds occupied on an average day. Ambulance response times have improved slightly, but are still way off target. Over 70,000 ambulance hours have been lost to handover delays in the last three weeks. Before winter set in, in the autumn statement, which seems like a long time ago already, the government announced a better than expected settlement for the NHS and social care. We welcomed it as a short term relief. But will it make any dent in the challenges ahead? Challenges like the rising demand from an ageing population, staff pay, inflation, the backlog and the continuing impact of COVID and other winter viruses. And if the prospects are challenging for health and care, the funding allocated for other public services is not rosy. How long can the NHS be prioritised above other crucial services that play such a big part in keeping people well? So is this just a council of despair? What is the potential for staff to improve quality and efficiency in this environment? We know rapid improvement can happen under extreme pressures, as we saw in COVID in both health and care, and there are strong arguments for enabling staff to improve even under severe pressure. But even if we enable short term improvement in health and care services, what really needs to happen in the long term? Could we create health and care services that aren't plunged into crisis every winter? And if we did, would that be at the expense of public services outside health, where health is really generated, especially in local government? And where would the money come from in a country hemmed in by fiscal pressures and gloomy forecasts for future growth? So quite a few questions for us to chew on, I think. Um, before we get started, I'll just talk you through what's going to happen. We're going to hear from Anita first to give us some context about where the NHS and care system is for about 10 minutes or so. And after that, I'm going to ask Amar, Hazel and Gemma to respond with their own reflections for about five minutes or so each, and then we'll have a discussion. For this last part of the webinar, we want to hear your questions. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. Viewers can upvote, upvote questions they'd like to see by clicking on the thumbs up icon in the Q&A function, and we'll try and answer the most popular questions as well as some that catch our attention. And finally, for anyone wishing to tweet, today's hashtag is hashtag NHS ready for winter. So without further ado, let's start. So can I hand over to Anita for her to set the scene? Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So I'll see scratch, share my screen, everybody, and uh, I get back to this. There we go. Um, well, uh, hello, and um, thank you for giving up your time on Friday to join us today for this uh, discussion. Um, I, I'm going to focus on um, money 
uh, to set out that, that, that context. In that, I've got more data on the NHS than I've got on social care at the moment, because we haven't had local government settlement uh, yet, which will really enable us to um, unpack what's going on. So um, I, I think um, the autumn statement against an incredibly difficult um, uh, economic and fiscal backdrop did actually um, award extra funding to the NHS. <clears throat> so what um, the Chancellor uh, set out was an increase of £3.3 billion into the um, health service for next year and the year after. Um, he also announced, and I think this is a really important moment that we ought to uh, acknowledge, um, increases for social care um, of 2.8 billion for next year and then 4.7 billion for the year after. That is in 24-25, in I think the first time in my living memory where the amount of extra money going into social care actually exceeds the amount of extra money going into the NHS. Now we need to see how the detail of that social care injection plays out in terms of what's happening to underlying um, uh, local government finances. But nevertheless, I think it's really important to uh, acknowledge that one of the things that hopefully has happened is that government has realised that um, it, it, you cannot address the issues in the NHS unless you address the issues in social care. And that also um, social care in particular has had an incredibly challenging um, more than a decade, which has had a real impact on the people who need those services. So, so that's, if you like, um, the context of um, an NHS that was prioritised. Now, those are large sums of money um, in any normal sense of the word, but um, they are against a backdrop that part of the reason why things are so difficult at the moment across society is because we have this very high inflation. So the key question then is, well, how do the, those injections of extra funding compare with inflation? Um, and what does that, that mean? So um, uh, there are two things that I think I really want to highlight and emphasize here. The extra money that the Chancellor uh, announced, the 3.3 billion, is going into the budget of NHS England. Yeah? And NHS England are part of the uh, of health spending, but they're not the totality of health spending. And so most importantly, there are three areas of health spending that are outside of NHS England's purview. And that's capital investment in building and equipment and IT. It's the investment in education and training of the workforce of the uh, future. And it's the investment through the public health grant in frontline public health services like um, <clears throat> health visiting, smoking cessation, drug and alcohol, uh, uh, and all of those. So three point, and no extra funding was given to that wider um, uh, health budget. So 3.3 billion pounds a year, when you allow for inflation, amounts to an increase of 2% a year in the NHS budget in real terms for the next two years. But when we look at the health budget as a whole, what that adds up to is an increase for each year for the next two years in real terms of 1.2% a year. So that's the second from the bottom line on this table here. So 1.2% a year, how does that compare to historic increases? So over the history of the NHS as a whole, this will be over 75 years, pretty much dead on 75 years in, in this chart because we don't have the first year of the NHS. Um, <clears throat> that is a third of the annual rate of increase that we've seen. So the historic average is 3.3%. It is, if you look back through different periods in the NHS history, broadly speaking, <clears throat> a similar rate of increase to that which we saw under that coalition government when austerity came in. Now it's of a much higher base, yeah, we're obviously spending vastly more now than we were then. But the next two years, the additional funding increases are comparatively um, modest. And one of the things that uh, I said, which is really important, is, is that this is against a backdrop of high inflation. And this is very techie, but really quite significant. Um, so the way that the um, 
increases in the health budget are calculated in line with all public spending is using a measure of inflation called the GDP deflator. And that's in purple here. And at the time of the autumn statement, new forecasts were uh, produced by the Office of Budget Responsibility for inflation. Yeah. And if you see, um, historically, you know, there are different ways of measuring inflation. Uh, a small minority of people like Gemma and I worry about that, but they're not really material things. Actually, at the moment, measurement of inflation um, is very challenging um, and very material. So on the GDP deflator, inflation is uh, much higher than the target and higher than it has been. But it, as you can see, it is half um, in 2023, the estimate of inflation if you use the consumer price index, CPI. Office of Budget Responsibility said that it's very difficult at the moment for them accurately to measure the inflation that public services are facing, um, which is what's relevant here. And it's probably somewhere between the GDP deflator, which is that purple bar, <coughs> and consumer price index. Why does that matter? Well, that matters um, it is because therefore that increase that I quoted of uh, total health budget rising by 1.2% a year in real terms over the next two years is the little red dot at the top there. That falls to 0.8% if you were measuring this according to consumer prices uh, index. That would be a lower increase than we saw at the uh, beginning of the 2010s under the peak of austerity. NHS England it takes that increase from 2% down to more like 1.5% of the capital budget, it takes a positive increase to a negative increase. <clears throat> I mean, the precise details of how you measure inflation don't matter. What I think is the really important point to note is the spending power of this settlement depends enormously on what happens to pay, which is one of our big price pressures in the health service. And we know that obviously um, industrial action is ongoing. And, um, and there is a big question about can that be settled without further um, increases in pay. Um, it also depends on what happens to energy prices and other um, goods and services uh, that, 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 that we see. The Office of Budget Responsibility is hoping, I think, and forecasting that inflation, whilst very high, will come down quite quickly. Yeah, obviously, for a whole host of reasons, we need to hope that that's the case. But that will be very significant in, I think, determining just how far this money can go. <clears throat> the second thing to say is that the government is saying, and NHS England is saying, that although this is in some senses a tight settlement for future funding increases, they do think that they can meet their core targets and objectives in NHS England welcomed the settlement. The reason that they <clears throat> said that, I think, is because the, uh, <coughs> they, <coughs> they've uh, essentially committed to delivering very, very uh, aggressive efficiency, rates of efficiency improvement in the NHS. So on average, um, historically, <clears throat> prior to COVID, NHS efficiency had increased by just under 1% a year. The long-term plan that was uh, set out in 2019 um, uh, at the NHS's 70th anniversary set a slightly more uh, ambitious target of 1.1%. Productivity took a very significant uh, hit during uh, COVID, partly due to infection, uh, infection control um, and disease prevention uh, measures, changing the way we delivered uh, care higher sickness, absence, things like that. Um, <clears throat> government, the NHS uh, is now aiming for efficiency increases of 2.2% uh, a, a year going forward to recover some of that uh, uh, productivity hit. And we might talk about just what needs to happen there and how realistic that is. <clears throat> it's fair to say at the moment that we are really struggling to... Um, to, to bounce back uh, from, from COVID. Um, and so this is looking at the uh, what's happening 
to elective activity <clears throat> um, before, during uh, and during uh, COVID. That's that purple line, as you see, took an enormous hit. Um, the, uh, in the elective recovery plan, the NHS is targeting increase in uh, elective activity of 30%. <clears throat> and by the spring, we'd be operating, if we were on trajectory for that, at 110% of activity pre-COVID. You can see we are going to need a very steep line up through this winter um, to, to get close to, to that. Um, uh, and I guess that is because um, COVID is ongoing and the system has suffered such a, a, a shock. Um, but one of the questions clearly is what will it actually take therefore to begin to uh, recover services and to recover services in a sustainable way. The second issue, which I think is, is kind of really um, in, important then, is to think about how important capital investment is to this agenda, not just of recovery, but also um, uh, reform, because alongside managing COVID, recovering the backlog, also got a really important need to reform the way that we uh, deliver care, to achieve the goals set out in the NHS long-term plan, to invest in mental health, to invest in community and primary care, and to meet the needs of our aging population. Um, and over this decade, the number of people over 80 uh, increases by a third, the number of people at the end of life increased by a fifth, and we must certainly need more capacity. As you can see again, actually, I think the government has realized that um, capital investment is an issue. And this shows how funding for day-to-day um, -day running costs, which is the red line, and capital investment compares since 2009-10. So as you can see, actually, um, we will be spending by the end of this period 40% more on day-to-day -day running costs than we were um, 15 years ago. That's the red line. Capital investment actually um, was very low uh, through, uh, through the last decade, but there is now a commitment to increase capital investment um, and capital investment um, will rise quite significantly over these years. And, but obviously that also is affected by the inflation in, uh, in construction. Uh, and Steve Barkley has, has already said that the commitment to 40 hospitals project is, is, uh, is suffering from, from, from uh, uh, inflation. The other thing I think just to bear in mind is because of all those years of low capital investment, we we'll have built up a huge backlog of maintenance. So the extent to which this extra capital investment can build new capacity as opposed to address the maintenance backlog, I think is, is really open to question. So we are now at a maintenance backlog in total, which is over 11 billion pounds. Uh, and I've shaded this to do with, uh, based on, on the extent to which that is high risk or significant risk, moderate or low risk. And, as, and the darker shades are, are the higher risk. And as you can see, a very substantial chunk now of that maintenance uh, of that maintenance backlog is high or significant uh, uh, risk. So just to conclude uh, 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 and end my opening remarks, um, I think we do need to acknowledge that extra funding is going coming in. The extent to which that funding though can support <clears throat> uh, the, the the policy goals for both um, uh, managing COVID, recovering the backlog, and delivering the transformative change that's set out in the long-term plan and is needed with an aging population, will depend on our ability to deliver efficiency savings, on the range of calls on that budget, and the uh, extent to which inflation really eats into the spending power that that cash provides. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Um, really clear and compelling as always. Um, I just want to ask you quickly before we turn to um, Dr. Shah, uh, 
you mentioned efficiency gains and the potential for them possibly not to be deliverable on the scale in the past. Can you just say quickly a bit more about that? Maybe we can come back to it later in the discussion as well. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the, the most obvious things is when we look over um, a period of decades, <clears throat> we see that one of the biggest sources of efficiency gains is shorter length of stay and a move to day case uh, surgery, partly as a result of technological innovation. Yeah, so new anesthesia. Um, <clears throat> Fred, friend of mine had his hip replaced last week, day case due to the very clever robotics now, absolutely remarkable. So um, average length of stay has consistently uh, uh, fallen, but it's now rising again. And that points to some of the issues that I think people are very familiar with about our ability to, to, to move people through the system really effectively. And what the CQC has described it as a system now, which is gridlocked and it's gridlocked within the NHS and potentially gridlocked between the NHS and, uh, and, and social uh, care. But I think one of the other really important bits of context here is <clears throat> um, the extent to which, while we're still managing COVID, uh, COVID makes it harder to achieve some of those ongoing efficiencies, both in the way that we treat people. So if we're picking up more COVID, is pre-operative length of stay longer, for example, because we're identifying lots of COVID. Are, 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 are many people, older people, deconditioned and, and so harder to get home now as a result of COVID? But also what COVID done in terms of our staff and teams and the ability for them to recover and <clears throat> get back to ways of delivering care uh, uh, from before. So, so I think we need to think both about the practicalities, but also almost what I've called trauma-informed practice. We'll have a service which has been through a trauma and has been jolted out of its normal way of working. And, and, and how do we get back to that way of working? I mean, you probably don't click your fingers and magically everyone goes back to how they were before. And you see this across both the NHS and social care. And I think one of the interesting leadership challenges is, is how do you take that recognition and understanding of what people have been through? And really that informs the leadership job uh, of, of, of recovery. Thank you. I'm sure um, this is a, a, a topic we'll come back to. And in fact, maybe that um, Dr. Shah, who I'm going to invite now to respond for five minutes, may touch on. Thank you. Very much. So we have a constellation of challenges here from the funding to thinking about productivity and efficiency with the resource we have we can see clearly that we're not meeting performance goals that we were previously meeting there's even quality challenges uh, the inequities in the quality that we're delivering are becoming clearer and clearer to us some of the safety gains that we made over the last decade seem to be slipping in healthcare over the last three years. So we have a constellation of challenges here. They're, they're big, they're complex, and they're, I would suggest they're interrelated. Um, so I can understand the need for urgency and the need for quick solutions to this, but I'm not sure we do have the solutions. Um, I, I think the approach to this needs to be one where we are going to have to be creative and we're going to have to think about solving these challenges simultaneously um, involving a range of people with a range of skills in this um, and we're doing this at the same time as the, as the workforce in health and social care is is exhausted um, so I guess my my challenge to us is to think what is our mindset going to be in terms of tackling this uh, do we think we have the solution do we think this is a problem that which we face before and have the solutions and we can simply uh, tell people what to do and it will solve this problem because um, I don't think that's the case um, and yet that's largely what I see happening um, you know that that mindset of seeing this as a technical problem is is flawed in my view this is the very definition of a complex adaptive problem where we're going to have to experiment and be creative and involve a broad range of people in discovering how to work our way through this so my um, suggestion is that you know leadership through the next few months is going to be absolutely critical um, the really good leadership that guided us through the complexity of the pandemic um, when we looked at this and researched it was showed that people valued leadership that was clear about priorities 
gave clarity about what our priorities should be, but also gave permission to people to be able to adapt, be agile and experiment in order to learn what works best. And we're going to have to come back to that now and really reinforce those principles in the way that we lead our systems through the next few months. I'd also suggest that the systems that um, seem to navigate the pandemic best were those that really utilize the assets they have in the system, one of which is improvement science. Uh, we spent years and years building improvement capability across the health and care system. Um, and I think it offers us a lot, a lot during times like this. We have a way to untangle the complexity and approach it in a systematic, more scientific way. We're certainly more likely to come up with more sustainable solutions if the solutions are owned more by the people who are working within those services. Uh, we're going to take a much more asset-based approach, looking at the whole system rather than just component bits of it and looking outside our traditional areas where we might normally have found solutions to thinking differently about what else in the system may support us with these challenges. We'll definitely be more innovative and creative if we if we involve people with a diverse set of views, including citizens and, and service users and patients themselves in thinking about what we can do differently to this. And the research tells us that if we involve people in this sort of uh, change effort, we are likely to see um, people have a better experience at work, um, but we're likely to have better better safety and we like to have better engagement from our workforce. So I, I think there's there's a lot of reasons why taking an improvement approach to this allows us to provide really clear leadership around what the priorities should be. But giving people the chance to own the challenges themselves will allow us to come up with better and more sustainable solutions. Because of course, these, are, these things are not unrelated. When we focus on what really matters to our citizens and patients and service users, we actually find that our, our workforce identify waste in the system. They remove that, automatically making us more productive and efficient and improving the quality of care. And if we do it in a scientific way, we'll be able to really carefully measure how we're doing to make sure we're not doing that in an inequitable way, but we're keeping an eye on equity as we do improve quality and performance. And applying improvement, we know the evidence tells us that, that enables our workforce to feel more engaged and, and um, have a better experience at work. So I think the only answer to this really is to take a complex adaptive mindset to this and bring our leadership for improvement and deploy our improvement skills to help us navigate this. And we, the only way we have to solve these multitude of challenges is to involve as wide a range of people as close to where the issues are faced as possible. Thank you, really thought provoking. Um, and I just wanted just the question raised at the very end there by Anita, what your thoughts were about how do you do this with staff, some of whom must feel very traumatized. Perhaps that is the sort of upside of having this training means that there's a way to engage them but I, I don't know how do, how do you manage that as a leader firstly by being mindful of it being by being attentive of it by by being open about it and inviting people to share their experience um, as well as trauma there's also moral distress that what people are experiencing over the last three years and there's also burnout um, uh, and I think we have to be thoughtful about all of those things and, and make sure that our leadership doesn't perpetuate those in the way that we uh, try to solve these problems. Actually, what we found is that if, if you actually take the problem out and, and enable the teams to actually connect with it and think about, you know, our leadership job really is to give them the time and space to think. If we can give them the time and space to think about the challenge and what they can do differently in their day to day work, the solutions are often there. And the results from our work over the last few years show that actually we can navigate these challenges and see gains on performance, quality and finance and productivity if we simply give people the mechanisms to be able to, to be creative and thoughtful about their work. Thank you. And perhaps we can come back to what might need to change at national level to, to make this happen on a bigger scale. But let me um, first turn next turn to Hazel Summers to give her reflections on on this. OK, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, just wanted to talk a little bit about finance. I didn't think I was going to, but just after what Anita has just said about the injection of cash into adult social care, I don't want people to get too overexcited about, uh, about what that is. So the 7.5 billion, as Anita said, uh, 2.8, 23, 24, and 4.7 in 2024, uh, sorry, to 24, 25. However, only 1 billion in 2023 and 24 and 1.7 is new. Of the rest, 3.2 over the two years comes from uh, pausing the funding reforms for the charging funding form. 
and it is expected to be shared across children and adults. The rest of the monies will come from uh, raising council taxes and not everybody will be able to raise the same amount from council taxes. So there's an assumption that the precept will be set. Um, and that will be the full precept. But it's worth saying that in more deprived areas, you get less money from your council tax than you do in more affluent areas. So, I, I, I mean, we really welcome the money. Don't don't get me wrong. Of course we do. But I don't want people to think that that is just 7.2 billion. It's not all going to be spent on adult social care. Some of it will go on to children's and some of it makes us some assumptions about the precept. So, so. I just wanted to say that, and I think part of what we are saying is because there hasn't been a full funding settlement, we worry that this won't be able to fund um, fund reforms. We want to move to, you know, we've long wanted to move to different models of more personalised care, about creating the care that people actually want. But we are thinking at the moment this might just about cover inflation. So because we're starting from a low baseline. So, so there... So I, I took your point and you said that inflation might come down, et cetera. But I just wanted to say that because I, I, I think there's a kind of, oh, loads of money going into adult school. Shit. Yes, we welcome it. And there it is more than we expected, but not as much as we wanted. And what there wasn't was as a, a fully funded settlement of what we would need to be and all the reforms that we need to take forward. I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about the House of Lords report that just came out uh, earlier this week, might be just been yesterday in fact, but just to add to the gloom, I just want to talk to some messages that came out from the ADAS survey. The ADAS regularly surveyed ASAS across the country and there was one in autumn and I think one of uh, these are some of the key messages. Impact of the cost of living crisis has been disproportionately felt by people who draw on adult social care but also people who provide it. That won't surprise you because we've heard stories about food banks and, and all the rest of it. Um, rising costs are adding a further layer of pressures for adult social care providers. And most councils are saying they will struggle. They will struggle to deal with the failure of care providers this winter. There are not, not enough staff. We know that there are not enough staff, that there's been a high level of turnover in the last year. There's always a high level, it has been higher in the last year. We've talked about the exhaustion of staff. I think that is that is the same across health and care, really, and, and the recognition of com, com, comes with it. Some providers are handing back contracts. Um, I think COVID money's probably kept them going for a while. And actually those that weren't financially resilient are, are handing back contracts, etc. They are, directors are pessimistic about the finances of local health and care systems. 90% um, of directors reported that they feel pessimistic or very pessimistic about the financial look like for outlook for health and care locally. That's up from 85% earlier this year. And I think we are thinking adult social care is in a worse position this year than we were last winter. So I, 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 I hate to add to the gloom, but, but I just think we need to get a full picture around that. However, interestingly enough, and I think this is kind of runs counter to what people think uh, out there, is more home care hours continue to be delivered than have ever been. So I know there is, there is a shortage of staffing, but that is to meet the increased demand. We are still increasing the amount of home care. People are choosing to have home care more so than they have in the past, maybe for obvious reasons, but also because we're promoting people to be at home. But there has been an increase in home care over the last year, and I'm happy to share, share the statistics around that. There has been a, a House of Lords report that was published earlier this week, which was significantly informed by people with lived experience of adult social care. And it's called uh, Living a Gloriously Ordinary Life. And it talks about some of the challenges around the fact um, that there has been insufficient money for councils to implement the Care Act 2014 fully. And that there has been a lot of um, gatekeeping around it and not the kind of full choice of services, etc., that we want. And, and fundamentally, we want to uh, something which absolutely not says there is a national imperative around social care and that there is real focus on it in terms of moving things on, in terms of giving people the life that they want. We have to remember adult social care is 
a really important adjunct to health in terms of the work that we do, but it does operate in, in providing community support to people in a variety of different ways, in a variety, variety of different settings, and for a, a variety of different people with different types of needs and, and focus on prevention and all the rest of it. We really want to be in a position to do that. And I think our position is, is that until we have a proper funded settlement, which is longer lasting than we've got at the moment, and a workforce strategy, which absolutely covers both people who um, are social works and people who work for councils, but also work for people in much wider through our commission services as well, that we really do that. And we recognise the parity and the importance of what we do in what is a highly skilled workforce, really. So I, I wanted to kind of say is that we're ambitious. We are ambitious, but in order to really, um, you know, to, to kind of give people those gloriously ordinary lives that they want, we need something solid that sits on that. And we absolutely want to support our health colleagues and making sure that people don't stay in hospital longer than they should, making their conditions worsen. But we also don't want people to be placed when they are coming out of hospitals into places that are inappropriate and then they stay there and then they decondition and they don't move out either, which is not a good outcome for, for people who, who both use our services, but our citizens in general. So, so those are my reflections. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks very much, Hazel. And, and we had a question from the audience about how to, how, how is it ensured that the money that's allocated to social care goes to social care and isn't used on other things in local government? I think is it, there's a technical answer to that. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things. Don't forget what we've just said. Not all of that money will go to social care, adult social care. Some of it is for children's and local authorities will probably determine that themselves. Not everybody will um, uh, set the full precept, the, the council text precept, and not as many, and some councils won't bring in as much money as the others. I think there will be grant conditions that will come. Don't, I don't know that for sure, but there, there will be grant conditions, I think. Um, and I also think that there's another element of this, which is uh, the adult social care precept that for council tax will be spent on adult social care. Thank you so much. We'll come back to you. I'm sure there'll be lots more questions. Um, but uh, last but not least, Gemma, would you like to give your reflections? Thank you. Um, I thought I'd start by just sort of casting our minds back only just over a year ago to when we had the 2021 spending review setting out plans for this year and the next few years. And at that point, we were in a position of thinking this was a spending review that was intended to be significantly more generous than recent spending reviews, starting a period of more rapid spending growth and accompanied by ambitions for expectations of greater performance from services and thinking about, we were very much a year ago talking about how will government ensure it gets the better performance that it wants from the extra money that's going into lots of services? And things have changed very quickly uh, since then. There's the economic outlook and therefore the sort of public finance and public spending outlook just looks very different from where it was a year ago. Inflation has been much higher than we expected. Energy prices have been hugely higher than we expected. Interest rates have gone up much more quickly, putting pressure on uh, government finances from debt interest costs. Um, and so the set of forecasts that the Office of Budget Responsibility set out in mid-November that sort of set the scene for where we are now was much, much bleaker than where we thought we were going to be a year ago. Um, the forecasts for household incomes were particularly grim. Um, I mean, it, they're forecasting a two-year fall in household incomes of 7% in real terms, just unlike anything we've seen in the post-war period, at least. Um, and that, I think, should give us some sort of ancillary concerns about the discussion we're having here, which is that households are facing a very tough time. They're already starting to feel high energy costs, but the sorts of pressures that public services may be coming under in an environment where households are really struggling um, may put extra pressure on that sort of compound some of the things that you've already been talking about. Um, but in, in that context, and I think as um, Anita and Hazel have already said, uh, health and social care services perhaps got a better outcome from the autumn statement than we might have been expecting. There was extra money announced for those services alongside extra money for schools to try and help deal with 
at least some of the costs of higher uh, inflation that services are facing this year, but obviously um, not anywhere near enough to deal with all of the issues that those services face. I think it was it was in that context a relatively good settlement for health and social care. And I think for me, it's interesting um, seeing, I think there was a lot more attention to the detail of health and social care needs in the autumn statement than we've been used to seeing from previous chancellors. I think it's really interesting to think about how much that's influenced by Jeremy Hunt's background as a spending department minister and specifically having been a health minister and then chair of the health and social care committee um just there was i that hasn't been the case for previous chancellors and i think that was sort of reflected in the kinds of announcements that we saw and the, the announcement of a kind of setting up an nhs workforce plan and things like that alongside all of this um Sort of in contrast to that, the other public services didn't get any extra money in this autumn statement. So that means they're facing um, just sort of around 1% a year real terms cuts over the next two years for other big areas of public services like the criminal justice system. Um, the, uh, as Hazel already touched on, the, the implications for uh, social care, I mean, that was a large amount of money in the context of the social care budget. Um, as Hazel rightly points out, a large part of this is assumed to come from increases in council tax. Um, two things there, as Hazel already alluded to, one is that not all councils may increase the precept, as the uh, increased council tax rates as much as they are allowed to. I think around only around 45% of councils last year imposed the full council tax rise that they could have imposed. So not all of them may go for that. Secondly, uh, as Hazel said, it, this how much you can raise from a, an increase in your council tax rates depends very much on the, uh, the depth and breadth of your council tax base. And some parts of the country will raise much more than others. And there's quite a strong relationship between levels of deprivation and the degree to which councils raise money from increased council tax rates. So more deprived areas tend to raise less from that. So one crucial part of the jigsaw that we haven't seen yet is how central government decides to allocate grants to different areas. Do they allocate grants in such a way to kind of even out that picture from the council tax revenue side is an important question yet to be answered. Um, the other we've we're sort of focusing in this discussion on uh, can we get through winter uh, 2022, which is the most immediate question, but just to sort of look beyond that at what we learned from the autumn statement about spending beyond the end of this spending review period, so from uh, sort of into the next parliament, um, a few things to flag there. One is that Jeremy Hunt has adopted a looser set of fiscal rules than we previously had, which has given himself a bit more room for manoeuvre in terms of limiting the extent to which he had to announce uh, tax rises or spending cuts. So he's now aiming to get debt falling and borrowing back on track within five years rather than three years. Um, he's set out a set of rules that suggest he's happier with a higher level of borrowing than uh, the previous fiscal rules required. And he's given himself very little headroom against those fiscal targets. So if things get a bit worse, then he'd very quickly have to do more than he's already announced in order to stick with his fiscal rules. Um, there might be good reasons for him doing that. Uh, there are, for example, reasons to think that the assumptions that the OBR made about future debt interest costs are higher than um, perhaps they might be. So if, if things turn out better than the OBR suggested, then um, he'd have a bit more room to play with. Um, actually, just one thing I should have mentioned before, um, one of the things that set the context for public spending over the next few years was not only the downgrade in the economic forecast, but some of the choices that the government has made. And one of the crucial ones was um, that they reversed most of what has been announced in Kwasi Kwarteng's mini budget. But the bit they didn't reverse was the uh, abolition of the health and social care levy. So that was a really explicit choice to get rid of that sort of 18 billion pounds a year coming in from uh, extra taxes that had previously been earmarked for health and social care. So I think we do, we are still left with a bit it, it, less, a less sustainable outlook at the, now in terms of a kind of realism about how much tax revenue may need to be raised to 
continue to fund the sort of health and social care system that the public um, may be hoping for. Um, so to go back then to um, the, the next spending review period, um, my sort of looking at the numbers they've penciled in beyond the next election for public spending, uh, which have allowed them to say that debt will be falling and borrowing will go back to a sustainable level by the end of five years, um, assumes a very tight envelope for spending uh, in the next parliament. So with only something like 1% a year real terms growth on average in the next spending review period, um, that would be tighter than any spending review apart from the 2010 and 2015 ones. And as we know, the 2015 one itself turned out to be unsustainable and had to be topped up quite significantly after that. So I think at the moment we have what I would describe as essentially an implausible set of spending assumptions into the next parliament that will have to be revisited with um, some serious consideration to what the next government wants to do, whether that's scaling back ambition for what services and welfare look like, or if you're not doing that, then a more serious question about how do you raise the tax revenues to make more money available. Thanks so much, Gemma. Um, lots of food for thought there, most of it somewhat kind of gloomy looking forward. Um, somebody's asked a question about winter pressures in other countries, but I wanted to ask if you could first give a sense of where we are in terms of the, these economic and fiscal pressures compared to other countries, because it does feel as though often that we're just in the worst possible place here. But what's what's happening elsewhere? And is there anything we can learn from that? So the UK is in some ways in a worse position than other countries. Certainly, if you look across the other major economies of the world, uh, the UK is the only one that hasn't rebounded back to at least the size of economy that we had before the pandemic. The UK does seem to have been doing less well than other countries. Um, it's not entirely clear why that is, um, although there are there's a reasonable amount of evidence there are some sort of ongoing drag on the UK economy from the decision to leave the European Union and what that has done to depress business investment and to put up barriers between the UK uh, and the rest of the world. Um, so it's not totally clear, but yes, we have been struggling more. And I think certainly in the in the current circumstance, the UK is suffering from an unfortunate um, coming together of two factors, which in other countries' cases, they're only really experiencing one or other of them. Um, specifically, that's energy price shock. So the UK, in common with the rest of Europe, is very exposed to the high oil and gas prices uh, as a result of the war in Ukraine. That's uh, dragging on economic activity and imposing costs on households and businesses. So that's affecting Europe. That's much less the case, for example, in the US, where because they're self-sufficient in gas production, they're not in, in, in affected in any, anything like the same way. Um, but the UK and US face a different economic challenge, which is a very tight labour market. So both countries um, really struggling to find workers to fill the jobs that there have been, and that's putting up with pressure on wages. That factor isn't uh, doesn't seem to be such an issue for the rest of Europe. So the UK has kind of unfortunately got these two things coming together that are dragging on economic growth. Thanks, Gemma. And I, I just to come back to this, the winter pressures in other countries. Maybe Anita, do you are you able to speak to this? That to yeah. the extent to which. Um, other countries right now. My impression is that there are actually problems in health services in other countries too. Yeah, so so we are not alone <clears throat> in finding, if you like, this phase of COVID is imposing considerable challenges. So if you think uh, at some of the things that are consistent across countries, which are we're having repeated waves of, of COVID, and then we're having outbreaks of infection and flu, and Australia had a, a very difficult flu, the issues with childhood it, it, infections as, as people come out of that, that, that sort of epidemiology, if you like, um, is not unique uh, to us. Um, the other thing which is not unique to us is shortages of healthcare workers and some of the issues about industrial relations. But the depth of those issues are, I think, more extreme in the, uh, in the UK, partly, as Gemma says, because of the wider labour market. A picture here and if you think in particular for social care yeah social care is experiencing um an absolute perfect storm between wider labor market pressures 
uh, and then the unique set of challenges of moral injury and trauma, et cetera, that have been uh, 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 have, have affected that 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 service. <coughs> um, that that staff are exhausted and have been through something profound again is common to many countries. But we did see, I think, that our backlogs are bigger here than in many other countries because we went into COVID with a system that had less capacity than most of our comparable countries with fewer beds, fewer nurses, fewer doctors, fewer diagnostics. And so we had to, uh, uh, we, we had to close down and delay more other care than, 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 than in other countries. So I would say not unique, but more significantly affected. And, and one of the challenges we've got is just almost each individual thing you might be able to deal with if, if that was the only thing you were dealing with. Yeah, so that'd be quite tricky. You could probably just about deal with it. It's across the board. <laughs> so we've talked about pressures on elective care, but also obviously one of the big things we're seeing is huge pressures on mental health which are, as, he, as, as Gemma has said, almost certainly going to be compounded by that wider economic con context. Um, so you've got, you know, children and adults coming out of COVID, um, big issues with mental health as a result of that, and then cost of living uh, crisis, which will place enormous pressures uh, on people's mental health and wellbeing. Thank you. I'm just spinning through the questions. Apologies for the delay there. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, we've got some, in, so there's a theme of questions coming through about the sort of, there's a mixture of ones that people who are feeling equally kind of begloomed by this, but also people who are asking questions about what can be done, what's the art of the possible, um, in particular sort of maximising kind of assets and the voluntary sector and the community and housing associations. I just wonder, Hazel, what, what your reflections are on, you know, we, we have to accept that there is this overall difficult picture and yet there is still a huge amount of energy um, in, in some sectors of, of society who, who really want to try and do something. So I, I was just um, reflecting really on what um, Amar said earlier around local leadership. And local leadership does not have to be health professionals or council professionals or others. It's how you take at a really place level, take the opportunities to absolutely not only bring in others in order to help and support to do that. So there are examples, I think, around um, how there's a real opportunity, isn't there, with ICBs and that really place place based approach in terms of leadership and how you might do that. So. I, I know that councils and the NHS is different. Councils, we're local, we're locally accountable to members, et cetera, democratically, uh, uh, you know, accountable in that way. And, but also, and health has, has a kind of top-down approach. But I think if we were really, really, really took an approach where you looked at things at a very place level, and that could be ICB level or it could be council level, it could even be smaller. Um, there are examples that, that I know, and I work, I have worked with a lot across the northwest just generally where the voluntary and community sector have really stepped up but in a really coordinated way in terms of how they have supported councils in terms of support and hospitals in terms of getting people out of hospitals you know just to check the house is okay you know just to check that the you know that the mats are pinned down so nobody's going to trip over them check the heating's on those, those kind of things. But it has to be a real commitment to working together where each partner is seen as value, valuable. And, and it's not just the voluntary and community sector, it's our providers of adult social care as well in the independent sector who, do, who are really un, unsung in terms of the really fantastic work many of them do. And actually they're innovative and they are, they have got ideas and they can move quickly. They can be fleet of foot and I don't think they are treated as equals I, I, I maybe other people would disagree with me but in the relationships that happens across you know the big players I don't think they are seen as equals and I think it's really really important that if we want to come up with some solutions we don't just look to ourselves we need to look to others to help us come up with some of those solutions I think um Certainly in my area, uh, across the Northwest, I have heard of people really, really working well with both providers and the VCS in order to, to move some of those stuff and to really use the opportunities of place level 
responsibilities in order to be able to come up with those solutions that are not imposed from somewhere in, you know, who lives, sorry, I'm going to say lives in London. I don't mean that. <laughs> this is my northern bias here, apologies. It's somebody who will, somebody who works in London and is just working across that, that area. We need to really be looking at a place level for solutions about how we do some of this stuff um, and how we do it together. And, and my final point is, 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 again, across the ICBs is really investing in community really really investing in community those are the things Anita was talking about that transformation in the way that I was talking about the transformation of adult social care we really need to be able to access OTs we need to access physiotherapists we need to access district nurses in order for people to be placed back in the right where they are and, and to use the levers that we've got now that we've got some of this place-based working to, to take that forward. Thank you really really um really interesting perspectives on this. And I wanted to bring in um, Amar on this one as well, because you you mentioned working with um, sort of communities and, and patients. You're in London as well. Um, a bit about how they're responding under this level of, of, of pressure and the degree to which people are willing to step forward or feeling a bit more on the, on the back foot in terms of the pressures that they're facing. I think uh, sometimes we underestimate um, how willing people are to help come up with um, solutions and co-produce solutions with us. Um, you know, all 50 of our teams who have long backlogs um, are currently working with their patients to understand, you know, what do they really need uh, from the service uh, and what does the service currently look like and what could we do differently to manage that demand in the future? I think we have to assume there's no more money. Um, even if we, uh, even if it does come eventually, I think we have to assume we need to meet this demand in new and creative ways. Um, and services uh, with patients are finding ways to to be more efficient, uh, removing some of the waste, the things that don't add value, to do things differently, and to ensure that people are getting some interventions even whilst they're waiting, um, that are making a difference for their outcomes. And there's a, there's a ton that we could be doing uh, around this. Another really great example is. Um, a service which is entirely um, in came out through innovation during the pandemic uh, to make sure that people weren't socially isolated. Uh, a, a befriending service uh, led and delivered entirely by our patients uh, that, are, that are now seeing hundreds of people each year, uh, giving people access to befriending support from someone with lived experience. Um, which is making a difference for them, making sure they're not socially isolated and making sure they can continue to live as good quality of life as possible. Uh, equally, there's lots we could be doing with local communities, uh, charities, voluntary sector in, in thinking about the whole pathway and the whole system response. So I think there's plenty if we just take a more systems view and, and approach this in a creative, innovative way. Thank you. And I think Hazel had something um, she wanted to add. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, actually. And um, certainly some places do have befriending services, which are absolutely brilliant and kind of supporting people not to go into hospital by taking them to doctor's appointments and, and various other areas. But I think what I, what I did really want to say is we need to not we need to not forget carers. There is a massive unpaid carer group of people there who are under extreme pressure and actually the more that we can do across our systems to support carers the the less likely that people will need to call on our, our you know more so, so more statutory support or, or more intensive support carers want to care for their loved ones but they want the support in order to be able to do that. And again, our local systems should be looking how best we support carers to do that because they are they are so undervalued and 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 there are so many of them out there and many of them we don't even know yet. So I, it would be very remiss of me if I didn't talk about that at all. Thank you. Um, really, really helpful. Uh, I, I, I was wondering about picking up. Oh, well, Anita's got that hand up. Um, I was going to come back to you, Anita. Um, you, some of the, the, the implications, I think, of, of some of um, Amar's earlier comments, um, you know, uh, about you know, things can be done locally, but there needs to be the right structures and the right contribution <coughs> higher up. What are you seeing this time about? We have been through winter crises before. They often result in quite directional performance management style approaches, command and control. What's your yeah. take on what we're seeing at the moment? I think the system is unsure which way to go. 
Um, so I think there are clearly um, strong pulls to have um, um, national kind of what works programs. And you <coughs> see this a bit in um, everyone having to have sort of cold surgical hubs. You know, these are protected spaces. Are we going to have PBR, payment by results, uh, uh, back role of the private sector? Some of the, you know, let's look at what we think worked before. What are some of the levers that we can pull nationally? And, and, and try and pull those uh, and the classic kind of uh, uh, performance management versus I, I think the countervailing thing that says, yes, um, as I said, set some priorities, but that actually the solutions to this lie locally. Um, the, I think the nervousness around that is the solutions lying locally requires quite a lot of leadership of integrated care systems and they are, well, they own, you know, very, very new. Yeah. So, but just, but if you're positive about that, they don't then have a lot of historical baggage, and this is their opportunity then to step into that space and show that they can really make a difference on, on, on the things that we need to do this winter. Um, I think the staffing point though is really important for the local solutions and the community. You know, pe people feel very done to at the moment, don't they? External life is putting huge pressure on. The ability to carve out some space of agency and ability of, of, to control things and influence things a bit more <clears throat> is, is even more important for, for both uh, staff and the people who use services at, at, at the moment. And so in that as well, if we take that approach, we are more likely to keep the staff, to engage the staff, all the things that are really important to this being sustainable, we're more likely then to have people not only who get through one negative episode in their ill health, but are actually on a path to more independent, uh, longer term life. And, you know, we can't, we have got a winter, which is an event, but we have got to see that solution to that as part of just one step on a, 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 a process to sustainability. Thank you. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts Anita and then maybe Gemma's and others if they want to contribute on this but one of the sort of um, themes that's come out narratives that's come out as the NHS gets under greater pressure and um, for all the reasons you've explained but efficiency is taken a mm -hmm. hit that there are now questions being asked about whether this is you know the right model should we change to somewhere else that doesn't get winter crises and so forth I wonder what your perceptions are of whether this is just a sort of minority pursuit saying this is you know the NHS model is now on you know within more winters that go by where this is happening yeah. um this is a, a a real threat or whether there is still really fundamentally strong support despite what we're seeing now yeah. um and, and Gemma's views on that too would be good so, uh, so I'll briefly say, I think, I mean, you know, the concern about whether the NHS is there for people delivering quality of care that people need are real and they're, 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 they've got really good uh, reason to be concerned, haven't they, at the moment? You know, if care is not where anyone would want it, yeah, and it, at, at the moment, despite huge efforts from people. <clears throat> The, um, the evidence um, in, from previous work, particularly led by the OECD, on, how, on, on, on kind of what we need to do in response to that is firstly, probably that we are short capacity. And when you operate a system at the edge of capacity, yeah, when it's not very resilient to shocks. We've had a shock and boy oh boy has our resilience been hit and clawing our way back is, is harder. So there is a question, you know, to what extent as a society do we want to put more capacity in so we're more resilient, or do we want to play our hand, take our chance, yeah, have a big high risk appetite and go, well, you know, um, we'll see. Um, the second thing is that in terms of efficiency of your system, all the evidence is that there isn't one model that's more efficient than another social insurance, public-private mix, there is all across Europe. Um, what matters is how well you run the system that you've got. So unfortunately for politicians, it doesn't look like there's any nice, neat silver bullet. Actually, it's a painstaking process of policy making 
and implementation back to what Amar was saying that really matters for um, for health system. And so that's a long haul and that's really good, consistent leadership and focusing on the long term. And so I was really heartened, for example, it, you know, it won't solve things overnight by in, in the um, autumn statement, by the commitment to proper workforce planning, because that is one of the things and a proper strategy for capital investment. Those are all the sorts of things, actually, you know, a proper uh, social care plan that sets out how we're going to deliver the 2014 Care Act. Those are all the things that in the end, you know, and painstaking implementation of those are what in the end will give us a health system and a care system to be proud of. Thank you. Um, Gemma, do you have, do, what are your perceptions as a sort of seasoned observer of this as well about whether this, this is a serious threat or just a thing that will pass? So I think I do worry about the sustainability of the approach that's been taken for a long time if, if from a very sort of big picture macro perspective, simply because of if you look over the post-war period since the creation of the NHS, we've spent more and more of our GDP on the health service as expectations of healthcare have expanded and as the population has aged and demands have grown. Um, and the politics all, for me, seem to point in the direction of continuing to favour the NHS over other things um, because of just how salient it is when You've got people lying on hospital trolleys, sitting in ambulances, not getting the treatment they need. Um, but the way we've afforded that uh, during most of the post-war period is by cutting back on other things that we haven't needed to spend as much money on. And defence was the really big one that we've spent far less and less on over time, and that's freed up money. And I just looking at the numbers it seems to me we've run out of road on finding other things that we no longer want to do as much of that enables us to do more of healthcare and so at that very macro level I, I worry that this sort of approach is coming to the end of the road um, and so we need to ask some more serious questions about how we continue to provide the levels of health and quality of life that people want um, within a more realistic envelope um so yeah I, I think there is whether it's what people are putting forward uh, I mean whether it's any of the answers that are sort of most prominent in the debate at the moment may not be right but I think it's sort of hard to avoid the question that we need to think a bit differently about some of this and perhaps be willing to consider options that have always been sacred counts and never on the table because I think if we if you don't make some more explicit choices, I think you end up making some implicit ones that are just as unpleasant, but perhaps less obvious. You ration care in uh, less less obvious, less sort of a deliberate, deliberate choice ways, but nonetheless, something around the edges is giving to, in the absence of a more explicit decision. I'd be interested to hear the views of both Amar and Hazel on this, actually, about what in terms of the, the sort of your interactions with with people locally, whether Amar questions are asked about it or people still really wanting to show that they can make this work. I sense a great deal of determination. Appetite is there. People are intrinsically motivated to to make sure that people are getting the optimal outcomes. That's, that's why people are coming to work despite being tired. Um, I think there's also a lot of generosity um, on the part of patients, citizens, partners to be able to help. The, there's no doubt that the, the developing place-based partnerships and integrated care boards have helped create more trusting relationships within which we can actually collaborate. Uh, I still think there's a real tension though between the need to act and solve a problem quickly, which sometimes leads to people reverting to command and control. And this is not going to be solved by command and control. If, if anybody has that mindset, they're sorely mistaken. And this isn't going to be solved by more money. In fact, if we really want to improve people's health, we have to take money out of the health system and give it to places like education and housing and employment. Thank you, Hazel. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would agree with uh, Amar about, um, about the 
people still want to do it despite you know i know that there have been um, workforce challenges uh, certainly in the care sector you can make more money working in little or aldi or, or somewhere like that that's particularly prevalent in a in a cost of living crisis i suppose but i just see absolute commitment from providers and from social care staff who really really just want to and social workers to absolutely not only do the right thing I think where you get beaten down and to not being able to do the right thing is when the resources just aren't available in in order for you to access. So, so what can be frustrating is if somebody presents to you and they have needs and you haven't got exactly what it is that the package you can pull together to make that. That is so frustrating for people. But I do think people plough on and, and I don't know that there is a I mean, I think I'm, we're still waiting to see what another system could look like. And, and if we got this right and we did do properly work across our systems where everybody was treated as equal with respect, we can come up with solutions, I think, that may look different and be different, but with a real focus on community and keeping people in their own homes. Because we all know if you are in a setting where you're, you're you deep condition, you're going to come out with worse. Uh, problems than you before and you may need care or community health for a lot longer so so we've got to get the balance right I think in terms of how we do this and and you know there's a lot of talk about integration but that's kind of structural and stuff we need to be getting on with the with how we're going to work with people in different ways where you absolutely not like put people at the center of what it is that you do across the whole system Thank you. Well, we're reaching the end, and I wonder if it's um, be all right to, to ask everyone for just a, a few concluding remarks um, from you about about what we've heard, uh, and maybe um, thinking about you know, do you think we are going to be in exactly the same place next winter, or are there embers of hope here? Anita, I'll, I'll go first on that. Well, so if 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 I'm going to be optimistic, yeah. Um, I think the, um, the glimmer of, of light in the autumn statement was the, the recognition, e e e even if the sums of money might not be quite what they seem, that um, we needed an, a, an effective social care system uh, going forward. And so m that suggests more government system thinking coupled with actually now with integrated care systems locally, more capacity locally to operate and, and really focus uh, systems. So maybe if we're feeling optimistic, although the challenges aren't going to be gone, aren't going to disappear in a year's time, in a year's time, we might be um, potentially quite a lot further down the track to being able to really focus on unlocking some of those system level interventions that could make a, a, a much better, greater difference. Um, Emma, a few thoughts from, including thoughts from you. Uh, two, two thoughts. My prediction is that this isn't winter. This is likely to be here with us for a long time we certainly haven't felt any let up of pressure um, yeah. but the second thought is that i am really optimistic i actually do think the solutions are there if we invite people to come and co-produce them with us and we will find a way through this with the right leadership and the right approach to it thank you hazel i don't think i've got anything to add to what anita and amar have said actually the, you know i'm an optimistic person i know that there's loads and loads of problems out there but but with goodwill and 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 actually government are taking more of an interest i think in adult social care which can only be a good thing but to really think across the system about how we do that but i i do think we absolutely not may need a proper funding settlement for adult social care and a proper workforce strategy and if we have those two things, I, I would be filled with a lot more optimism. Thank you, Hazel. And finally, Gemma. I think just to end on a, a positive note and building on Anita's areas of light, um, I think the other thing that is going on with 
this government is a genuine appetite for devolution of powers more broadly to local areas and thinking about deepening the mayoral combined authority deals and extending those out to other areas. So we're just listening particularly to Hazel and Emma talk about the opportunities for tailoring solutions locally. I think that's another possibly positive area where actually by devolving those powers and responsibilities down to a level where you can identify what works and how can you join up things across services within an area whilst having the centre there to provide a supporting role and probably to try and help ensure that lessons are learned across areas that could be another another way of getting things better. Thank you very much. Um, we're out of time, unfortunately, so uh, I wanted to thank all of you who've been listening and sending in questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. And I'd like to um, extend a big thank you to our panellists, Anita Charlesworth, Hazel Summers, Dr. Amar Shah and Gemma Tetlow. Thank you all very much and thanks for listening. <laughs>